Zechariah 8, beginning with verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you who, who have been hearing in these days. These words by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the day the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts, that the temple might be built. For before these days there were no wages for man, nor any hire for beasts. There was no peace from the enemy for whoever went out or came in. For I set all men, everyone, against his neighbor. But now I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground, <coughs> excuse me, the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these, and it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear, let your hands be strong. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I would not relent, so again in these days I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let us now continue in adoration of the one who sits on the throne.
people said, Amen. Please be seated. We have been in Paul's epistle to the region, the churches in the region at Ephesus for quite some time now. And if you're visiting with us, we are in the extended application portion of the letter. The first three chapters, Paul explains to us in marvelous detail and glorious doctrine what we are given in Christ. That is the operative phrase in the first three chapters, in Christ. All the blessings, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, that we express that we are blessed with in the heavenly places in Christ, that we are raised and that we will one day be ascended as Christ was because of what God has done in Christ through His power. We've been unified, Jew and Gentile, mankind and God in Christ in chapter 2. In chapter 3, it is the glorious gospel, the mysterious gospel that was accomplished in Christ. And because of what God has done in Christ, we now live a different way. Specifically, we live a different way in the context of the church. And the primary transformation that takes place in the lives of the believers is most fully on display because the church is where Christ best expresses himself. Paul says that in the middle or the, towards the end of chapter one, that the, the church is the fullness of Christ's expression. And he says at the end of chapter three, right before this application portion in chapters three through six, that God's glory is most on display in the church. Verse 21. Well, how then do we glorify God and live out our oneness in Christ? Chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So Paul's about to explain in chapters 4 through 6 how we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, how we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. It's a high calling, isn't it? The gospel, the hope to which we've been called. If it's glorious, then our living is to be glorious. If, it's, if, it's, if it is powerful, then our living is to reflect its power. If it is transformational, then our living is to reflect, reflect that we have indeed been transformed. And so this is the first phrase or the first word picture that Paul gives us for our transformation. Walking in a manner worthy of our calling. He's going to give us another phrase to reflect the transformation that has to take place in our life, and it's what we discussed last week, starting in verse 21, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him that is Christ, as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful di desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So the first image that we're supposed to see for our transformation is walking worthy. It's directional, it's intentional, and then the second image that Paul gives us in chapter 4 is putting off what is bad and putting on what is right. Remember, if you've been with us, and if you haven't, I'll just give you the phrase that we have been using. Chapters 1 through 3, I, I said probably, I don't know, five to ten times that it's like, it's like hiking the highest peaks of New Testament doctrine. It's like being in the Alps of the New Testament and seeing the beauty of gospel theology. Chapters 4 through 6 is the, the continued walk. It's, it's a descent down the mountain. It's, it's like our steps home. It's like we've seen the beauty of the peaks and we've still got a long walk to finish. We've still got a, lot, a, a long step, many steps ahead of us, a long road ahead of us. It's, it's like the walk home. 
And we're supposed to walk a certain way. And we're supposed to equip ourselves for that walk. We're supposed to wear the right things. Remember the, the, the phrase that I said, put off, put on? I said last week that it literally is the same ancient the phrase that the ancient world were used for the putting on of clothing or the taking off of clothing. It's the part that everybody sees about you. It's what is noticeable from your life. And so in our journey home, we're supposed to be properly equipped, wear the right clothing, and put on the right thing. So I'm just going to do what Paul is going to do, and he's going to just give us steps. Here's how you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Here's what you do. Here's the right clothing you should wear to reflect the internal transformation that takes place. Here's how it affects you on the outside. Now, I have a a, a concern, and I've shared it with, I think I shared it with our staff. I know I shared it with Pastor Brandon. shared it with my wife. I have a pastoral concern for chapters 4 through 6. And so I'm going to say it right now, because I want you to be aware of it. Chapters 4 through 6 is going to give us a lot of imperatives. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And I do not want you to hear chapters 4 through 6 as a list with little check boxes that if you do them, you're a good Christian. Because what that does is it completely removes chapters 1 through 3. Which points us back to the reality of why there can be anything good about you at all. And just living like don't do this and do this and don't do this and do this is just law living. Which is what Paul says in the middle of chapter 2. Christ died to nullify the law's demands and restrictions upon you. So I'm going to do my best to remind you of that, but please, and you're listening to chapters 4 through 6, the rest of our time together, it's going to be easy because today we're talking about truth-telling, we're talking about anger, and we're talking about work. So it's going to be easy for you to go, if I don't get mad, if I tell the truth, and if I work hard, I'm a good Christian. But the world thinks that you should tell the truth. Work hard. It's no different. So having told you what we're going to discuss this morning, let's, and having that warning in your mind, let's read our text. Verse 25. We're going to read down down through verse 28. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This morning, I want to show you that from this passage that walking worthy means we say the right things, express the right passions, and work the right way. Walking worthy means we say the right things, you could just say speak the truth, express the right passions, and work the right way. Now please, just to remind you again, warn you again, don't forget about those first two words. Walking worthy means We do these things because walking worthy is rooted in the gospel, not rooted in the law. Let's pray. We'll ask for the Lord's help to work through these concepts together. Father, we ask you that you would do your work now through the scriptures. The writer of Hebrews tells us that the the Bible, it's like it cuts us open and it reveals, uh, reveals who we are on the inside. It shows us everything about us. James tells us that it's a mirror and we see ourselves. And 
So I pray that you would cause us to listen to James this morning, that if we come to the mirror and we see a problem, that we would recognize that we need the Lord's grace to grow us up into Christ. I pray that you would keep from us any attitude that we, we, can, we can transform these things on our own. We can just work hard and, and do better. These things are an outgrowth of the gospel. And so help us do the work to do the right thing, but assure us that it's only by your grace. I ask that you'd speak now through your servant, through the scriptures. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood. Walking worthy, or you could say, a next step on our journey home is expressed in truth-telling. Is expressed in, verse 25, truth-telling. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Verse 25 has a very specific and logical connection back to verse 24. And put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Or another way that you could say that is the expression of right, righteousness and true holiness. So that which is right according to God, holy as God is holy, and expresses truth, true holiness. And so verse 25 comes immediately off the heels of verse 24, which points us back to the importance of truth. Truth is in the nature of God. Expressing truth is expressing God himself. So therefore, having put away, again, the same idea, putting it away. We've taken it off, and we're putting it away. Now, please, the, understand that while I started with all that warning about not, not being a law-oriented believer, also understand you have to do these things. That's the tension of this text. That's the tension of concepts like this. That yes, we understand that any good work is through God and the gospel, that, that this work is possible only through the gospel and, and God accomplished the gospel through Jesus Christ. But, but we have to obey the scriptures. And the problem is when we think we can obey the, law, the, the gospel's commands without gospel strength. That will inevitably lead to discouragement and frustration. The problem is too often that we try to live for God without God. Spurgeon said about a very similar text, not this text, it was actually 2 Peter chapter 1. Spurgeon said, as God has given every effort for us, we must give every effort for God. It's this partnership in our sanctification. It's not partnership in our salvation. Understand that. I mean, God did all of that. You just believed it and repented. But there's a partnership in our sanctification. God strengthens us, and we must do it. So the first thing that we have to do is put away falsehood because it's in the, it's in the truth of God to tell the truth. Or it's in the person of God to tell the truth. To express the truth is to express God himself. So put away falsehood and speak the truth. You heard this text read for you earlier. There's actually several Old Testament implications or references, excuse me, in this text together. The first one here is in Zechariah chapter 8 where Paul says, speak truth with one another. Speak truth with his neighbor. This is almost exactly uh, verbatim what we, read, what we had read for us earlier in Zechariah chapter 8. But Paul adds a qualification to it and another logical rationale for why we should speak the truth. Not just because it's in the person of God and not even fundamentally because we understand within human nature it's the right thing to do. But because we are members one of another. So speak the truth because you are one. Speak the truth because Christ has made you one. He's brought you to peace as Jew and Gentile and as believing Jew and as believing Gentile. He's brought you to peace, to oneness in God. So you should speak the truth because, because literally if you're, if you're not speaking the truth, you're, you're acting like you're separate. You're acting like you're, you're not one. 
It's the truth that brought you together. It's the truth that keeps you together. Therefore, you should speak the truth. And I think the, the lowest hanging application here is obviously don't lie to one another. Now, I, I hope we don't have that problem. I, truly, I hope when you came to church this morning, you haven't lied to somebody. Okay? Teenagers, that includes your parents. That includes each other. Mom and dad, that includes your kids. Exaggerated a problem. You said you're going to do something you have no intention of doing. Don't lie to one another. But, but specifically, it's actually a church context. You should be speaking truth one to another. But I don't think Paul only has the negative implication in mind. There's a positive implication here. Be a truth teller. Declare truth one to another. He's not just saying don't lie. He's actually saying minister the truth one to another. And, and, and we know that very clearly from the context. Because go back with, back with me to verse 20. That is not the way you learn Christ. That being the characteristics of the Gentiles who are unsaved in verses 17 to 19. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the, listen, truth is in Jesus. So when you minister truth, when you tell the truth, you are ministering the person of Christ. When you came this morning, was your only concern that you hear the preaching and other people hear the preaching, or did you think that you actually have an opportunity to speak truth to somebody else before the preaching started, before Sunday school started, and you could still do it when we're done here in our service time? Be a truth teller in the context of the church. This is not age restricted. Be a truth teller in the context of the church. So of course don't lie, but go a step further. Minister the truths of the gospel. Minister the truths of the person of Christ because the truth is in him and we are learning Christ Together, verse 20. Chrysostom, if you don't know Chrysostom, he's a famous third century preacher. He was known as the golden tongue. It says of this text, if the eye sees a serpent, does it deceive the foot? If the tongue tastes what is, the, what is bitter, does it deceive the stomach? In other words, the point is, if we're truly a body, we're going to perpetuate truth-telling for the health of the body. So have you spoken truth to anyone this morning? Actually, you all have. You may not realize you were doing it, but you have. If you sang during congregational singing. Because Paul says that when we sing together, we admonish one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're instructing one another. We're actually teaching one another when we sing, which is why congregational singing, not concert listening, is really important in church. Okay? But, so you already did, but that doesn't disqualify you from the opportunity to continue to tell truth. How many of you spoke truth to somebody this morning? You say, I'm not a Sunday school teacher. So? Do you know the truth? You don't need to know all the truth. You can know some of the truth to speak the truth. I don't know all the truth. I don't know anybody who knows all the truth. And if they, think, if they say to you they know all the truth, they apparently haven't learned the truth of humility. <laughs> truth. <laughs> so speak the truth. I mean, just, here's what God Here's what God showed me in his word. It was awesome. I just had to share it with somebody, and you're here, so I'm going to tell you. As a discouraged mom, and you find her, and you say, hey, it's going to be okay. God gives us strength. There's grace for this. There's grace for this. There's, this, there's a discouraged spouse. I said, listen, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It's going to be okay. There's a teenager who, co who comes to church and they're just here because their parents made them. 
And you can assure them that there's joy in Jesus Christ like, like nothing else offers them. Speak the truth one to another. Because it contributes to the health of our oneness that contributes to the health of our body. So having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. So he's going to continue to give us steps as we walk worthy. Paul's structure, um, sometimes Paul writes like he's shooting a rifle. Like he has a very, he's got a very clear thing in mind and, and everything is leading up to that and, and he wants you to get this one main idea. And then there are other times Paul's got a shotgun out and it's just all over the place. Here's an instruction and here's an instruction and here's an instruction. So we have the idea of walking worthy, governing everything that we're doing, but now the instruction seems a little bit haphazard. And it's not that he's writing carelessly, it's, his, it's the structure that he's writing, that he's listing these applications of the gospel. Having put away falsehood, tell the truth. Verse 26, another step along the way is acceptable anger. Acceptable anger. Verses 26, 26 through 27. This morning I get to tell you that it's okay to be mad. Aren't you excited about that? But listen, it's got some very specific parameters. Verse 26, be angry. You say, yeah, I like that one. But it keeps going. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Be angry and do not sin. So obviously there are acceptable reasons for anger. There must be acceptable reasons for anger. You and I tend to think of anger as only negative. And I would encourage you to think of anger with great caution. So Paul's going to say that it, actually there are acceptable reasons for anger. But I'm still going to I'm still going to encourage you to think of anger with great caution. And so does Paul. I'm not like disagreeing with the apostle. Paul's going to give us some warnings. I just think what we know about ourselves, that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things, and how we like to be angry sometimes, I think we should always treat anger, even if we understand that there's a place for it, with great caution. So let's look at these acceptable reasons together. What are the acceptable reasons for anger? Paul doesn't give them to us. He just says, be angry and do not sin, which is another Old Testament Quote, Psalm 4, verse 4, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. So this Old Testament, Old Testament text actually gives us one of the reasons for acceptable anger. I'm only, I'm only going to deal with two here. There are probably more, but the way that I have studied and understood the Scriptures, I, I really boiled it down to two. And the first one is, is implicit in the psalm, in, in Psalm 4. What's he angry about? The, psalm is ex, the psalmist in Psalm 4 is expressing anger at sin, namely injustice against God's children who are trying to live faithfully while others are living wickedly. So he looks at some of the people of, of, of Israel and they're living wickedly and he and others are trying to be faithful and it makes him angry at this injustice. So this is an anger that you and I probably understand. We get mad at this injustice too. Why do the wicked prosper, the psalmist says. This is a question we all struggle with. I'm sure we've labored with at some point. So this, this first acceptable reason to be angry is at sin. It is okay to be angry at sin. Now listen, it is not okay to be sinfully angry, but it is okay to be angry at sin. You say, well, what in the world does this look like? Well, the psalmist gives us one in Psalm 4. We see it throughout the psalms. I hate abortion. It makes me really angry. It makes me really angry. I 
I hate when my son is disrespectful with mommy. I hate it. By the way, my dad was the same way. Nothing made my dad matter than when we disrespected mom. Do you know why? Because we love mom. Sometimes, and it's because of psychological definitions, you and I actually, when I say you and I, I mean humanity, we tend to think of love and hate as opposites. But do you realize that they actually coordinate? Love and hate interact. I hate when my son's disrespectful. I don't hate my son. I love my son. I hate when my son's disrespectful. I hate that sin because I love his mom. And you don't talk to mom like that. And so it is with God's children. Righteous anger is hatred of that which is against God. It is okay to be mad at what is against God. That's acceptable anger. Now we can even take that anger too far. An anger that is born in a right motive can become sinful anger very quickly. But on its front side, it is okay and even a sign of godliness to hate what God hates and be angry about what God makes God angry and be angry about what disrespects God. I have read books in my office that are as liberal in their view of God as possible, and I just wanted to rip them in half because the God that they present is not my God. And it makes me angry. It's okay. Most of our anger is not like that, is it? Though? Let's be honest. Most of our anger or our blowing up is not godly anger like that. There's, a, there's another acceptable anger. There's another reason that makes anger acceptable. So his first anger is anger that is against God. The second form of anger is acceptable anger that is mingled with grief. So the first form of anger is anger that is, ex- that is against God. The second form of anger is anger that is mingled with grief. Take you to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. So he's in the place of religion. Jesus is in the place of religion. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees and other religious rulers are standing around. There's a man there with a withered hand, and they're going, all right, let's see what Jesus does here. Because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. So if he heals him, he's worked and we've got him. That's what they think. Because they're trying to accuse Jesus. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to, to do good or to do harm or to save a life or kill? But they were silent. Verse 5 says, and he looked around at them with anger. Jesus looked at the religious leaders with anger. Listen. And was grieved at their hardness of heart. He looked at them with anger and was grieved at their hardness of heart. Righteous anger, which we, we, we see Jesus express elsewhere. I mean, do you remember when he takes some ropes and makes a whip and drives all the... I mean, Jesus was mad when he cleansed the temple. And why is it, what does he say? You've made my father's house into a den of thieves. But Jesus' anger is mingled with grief for their hearts. 
And this is where we fail in our so-called righteous anger. We're mad at the problem, we're mad at the person, and we fail to consider the heart that is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things, and how the wrath of God apart from Jesus Christ rests on that individual. And then we forget to look back and recognize that it is of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed as well, but only through Christ that I have been given new life. So acceptable anger is for God against sin, and acceptable anger is mingled with grief on the behalf of the sinner. We seem to think that we're good at the first one, righteous anger, but what about the second one? Is your anger against the sin and the sinner? Because only God is holy in person, the law writer and law giver, to have a righteous love and a righteous hatred. So what makes you mad? Be angry and do not sin. What makes you mad? Is it righteous anger? I wish I could say that most of my anger was. I, I am not saying that. <laughs> I would not say that. I wish I could say that it was, but it's not. Anger itself is not the problem. It's how we express that anger and why. Because remember what I said a few moments ago, our love and our anger are, are mingled. They interact. You get angry about what you love. So if God is our love, we will reflect righteous anger. Anger. If I love myself, I'll get mad about everything that threatens what I want. If I love money, I'll get angry when the stock market is down. If I love comfort, I'll get angry when politics isn't working out for me. We get angry because we love. So if we love Christ and we're speaking truth and that we're learning Christ and being taught truth, our love, our anger will be filtered through righteous love for Christ. So there's acceptable reasons to be angry, but there's also an acceptable duration. How long should you be angry? Not long. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now listen, this doesn't only refer to marriage. And I think for some reason that's the only context that we think about this verse. If you have a good marriage, you don't stay angry, you know, you always make up before bed. I mean, that's a good principle, but that's, that's not all it's talking about. If you regard Bitterness in your heart. If you refuse to forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Some of you have been mad with somebody for years. You say, well, I thought I said about the good, kind of, the good kind of anger. How long is good anger? I don't think it's long. Because when we think about grief, it's hard to stay in that place. Look what the next thing he says is. And do not give place to the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil. You can just see him, Satan, roaring about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he sees that that one over there is mad. And that's where he goes. Because anger is, a, is, an, is, is an emotion that it, 
that usually accompanies thoughtlessness. You didn't mean to hit the thing that you did. You just did. You don't know where it came from. I do. Your heart. And when anger fills our minds and our hearts, you know who's right there? Just ready. Give no opportunity to the devil. Anger welcomes the temptations of Satan. Sinful anger welcomes the temptations of Satan. Sinful, I wrote this in my journal as I was studying this, sinful anger is fertile soil for Satan's seeds of dangerous deeds. Sinful anger is fertile soil for Satan's seeds of dangerous deeds. So is your anger good? Is it righteous? Is it godly? Is it rooted in good love? Gospel love that hates sin and desires right? We're about to have Lord's table. If you're angry with somebody, the godly thing to do would be to not take it. If, you regard, if you're bitter in your heart, the sun has gone down in your wrath way too many times, and you're just ignoring it. Sweeping it under the rug. It's what good Christians do. They just ignore it. They say, well, they haven't asked for forgiveness. They haven't made it right with me. What were the dying words of Jesus Christ? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Forgiveness, the request for forgiveness is not always extended. An apology is not always extended, but the opportunity to forgive is always present. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath one more day. They don't have to ask for you to release Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. We're putting off the old man. We're putting on the new man, growing up into the person of Christ because of the gospel's sanctifying, transforming work in our heart. Because verse 23 and 24, our minds are being renewed and so we're putting away falsehood and we're telling the truth. We're being, we're being guided in good anger and we're refusing sinful anger. And verse 28, we're living an honest life. And verse 28 gives us some principles for proper provision. Proper provision for ourselves and even for others. Let the thief no longer steal. I mean, again, a, a, a fairly obvious application we've got we've got we've got we've got commandment ten commandments stuff here do not steal show integrity with the material items that you have if something belongs to somebody else don't take it and and I would hope I would hope that I don't have to really linger on that one because you get it and I don't think we have many thieves in here I mean, some of you take candy out of the church office, but that's okay. <laughs> it's all right. That's what it's there for. You take candy out of my office, we're going to have a problem. But church office is fine. There's a reason uh, my snacks are hidden in my office. No, I'm just kidding. But what, again, what about the next few lines? I, I can assume you're not stealing, and I hope... I can assume that, okay? Let's just agree that I can hope that. But what about the next lines? Honest work with his own hands. So work hard. Do what you need to do. Fulfill your responsibility. 
I don't know what, I, mean, I, I know many of you, so I know what you do for work. I don't know what you do like when you get there and, and what that entails for you and how you manage your schedule and how you maybe interact with your, but work honestly to provide. God has ordained work. It was present before sin in the garden. He gave man a job. And then after the fall, work got miserable. So you can blame Adam and Eve. No, I want to be really compassionate. I want to be compassionate as I can. I want to be really sensitive in how I say this. But often, I will counsel people who are very depressed. And there's so many things that go into that, and so I don't want to oversimplify it. But I have had counseling cases. When you ask them what they do, they say, I don't really do anything. And, well, how do you spend your time? Well, I, I you know, I'm really bummed out, so I watch TV and, you know, I, if you don't work, you will feel bad. Do you know why? God ordained men and women to do things. So again, I don't want to oversimplify, but I have counseled people who are depressed because they're not working. And they feel useless. And they don't know why they feel useless. God has ordained people to do things. Work. Honest work. But what's the next thing that he says? So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Americans, the American dream, right? We work to build our accounts so that we can have good retirement, so that we can retire where we want to retire and have our children live with us if they want to live with us and, I mean, and, and live close to us if they want to live close to us. And if we want to live far away from our family, we can do that too. But we've worked so that we can gain and we've gained so that we can make our life good. The happiest people I know are giving people. And they work for the intent of generosity. That's what they consider when they work. I have to go and I have to provide, I have to go and I have to work because other people need things too. And God bless as a cheerful giver. If you wanted to outline verse 28, it would be this. Stop stealing, work to live, and work to give. You say the first one doesn't rhyme, but you'll probably remember it. Stop stealing, work to live, and work to give. Do honest work for your own provision and to contribute to the needs of and opportunities in others' lives. And these are expressions of what God is doing by His grace to grow us up into Christ so that we speak the truth that Christ Himself is teaching us as we, verse 20, learn Christ and we put off anger and we put away anger so that our passions are being purified by Christ Himself so that even when we get mad, we get mad about the right things. And even when we get mad, it's a short anger. It's a controlled anger. And then when we look at our lives and we recognize what we need and what we need to live and what others need and what they need to live, that God has given us a means to, to, to meet those needs. It's called work. And then when we do that, we can be generous with what He's given. We're reflecting the goodness of the gospel. And the transformation that takes place when the old man is dead and all things have become new. 
Now listen, this is instruction for those who believed in Jesus Christ. He makes that really clear. He actually draws a line in the sand in, in verse 20. That is not the way you learn Christ. Verses 17 to 19, the, the, the Gentiles who are, who are following the futility of their own minds, they're darkening their understanding, they're alienated from the life of God, they're not saved, they're not in Christ. They live dishonestly, they live angrily, they tell lies. But you who are in Christ, you live differently. You may not be in Christ this morning. And so you will naturally hear everything I just told you as something that good people should do. If you want to live a better life and be more moral, you'll do these things. It's not possible to live a good life and have a good future and joy and peace apart from Jesus Christ. If you're with us this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not in Christ, let me encourage you to listen to the words of Jesus Christ himself that I read in Mark chapter 3. Come here. That you may know the restoring work of Jesus Christ. You don't have to just work harder and be better and feel the constant crushing weight of being a better human because Jesus Christ brings you into the family of God and you can be a faithful, loved, transformed child.